Good morning, I am Dan Coots, and today I'm joined by the mayor of Wilmington. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Dan. So, today I want to ask you a few questions about your personal life and your life as a mayor. Sure. So, I'm going to start off as your life as a mayor. So, as a mayor, uh, as a mayor, it has to be a little stressful. So, like, what is your favorite thing to do to unwind? Oh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, uh, my, my two, well, first of all, I have grandchildren that are wonderful. I have a great family life. Um, I like to play golf. I'm not, I'm not good enough, but I like to play golf. And I have a boat that I love to go on down on the, on the Elk River in uh, Maryland. And so that's kind of uh, that's best place where I. That's my happy place to get down there and forget about all the headaches back here. Okay, so more on your boat. Just to get into your personal life a little bit. Yeah. What type of boat do you have? It's a 28-foot bow rider, twin engine, black, pretty. I love it. Okay, so more in your personal life. You said you have grandchildren, which means you have to have children. Ah, yes. So um, do you have any family nights? Family nights? Yeah. Well, my son, my oldest son lives in Philly. My daughter lives here, and my youngest son lives with us. And uh, so there are times when we all get together. Uh, but we have, we, have, we have a wonderful family, and I'm, I'm blessed for it. Okay, so do you have any um, favorite times with your family? Well, I like to go up to Philly. The, my grandchildren are all under three, so it's, it's, you know, it's not like we're going to go out and play baseball together. We, uh, it's just me and the kids. They call me Lala, and that's the sweetest thing in the world when the kids call my name. Like, you know, I get up in the morning. I'll be dead asleep at 5.30 in the morning, and I'll hear my granddaughter who's staying with us just say, Bibi, that's my my. my Baby, Lala, come get me. <laughs> you know, so I've got to go up and get her at 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, which is a joy. And I love bringing her down and we watch Elmo or we watch Peppa Pig or you know, Paw Patrol. I mean, stuff I never knew about a year ago. But yeah, that's what we do. Okay, so going back into your life as a mayor, yeah. um, do, you have any current, um, do you have any current things you're working on? There are always things we're working on. Even, you know, to the extent of <clears throat> helping to attract restaurants to the city. You know, I, I go out personally and try to recruit people who've got uh, high-end or attractive restaurants to come to the city because that gives people a reason to come here and enjoy the vibe of the city. And there was a time, there was a time when there really were very few decent restaurants down, downtown. And today we've got an array of really high-end, high-end restaurants in a, in a, in a feel-good urban environment, which people like, you know, as opposed to going out in some suburban strip center, and and uh, just seems it seems kind of artificial to me. Whereas I, I, you know, I think the city, the city's feels really good right today. And uh, so, as I said, we attract the restaurants, we attract the the developers who are today building apartments. We have. It seems that we have a thousand apartments under construction all the time. So when one is finished, we have somebody else moving in and continuing to build. And it's important for us because in the world we live in today, uh, the big companies are not requiring people to come into the city to work. They can work at home. It's a, it's a fairly recent phenomenon, but it's something we city mayors have to deal with everywhere. So when they leave, you lose a certain amount of revenue from wage tax, you lose economic activity at restaurants when they're not there. So to replace them, the offset has been the people moving into the city. So now we have people living in apartments more than ever before. And so they're, they're helping with our city economy as well. So that's, uh, they're the things I do. I do them all the time. Okay, so going back to the restaurants, what is your favorite restaurant? I gotta tell you, I, you know, of everything we do, Bardea continues to amaze me how good they are. They just, they're always really, really good. I'll get in trouble with everybody else, but <laughs> no, they're, they're really good. We've got Coin that's just opened up. They've been real good. Bardea Steak is great. Uh, Le Cave's been really great. And then I think we have some others uh, around the city that, you know, have been really terrific for years. And so I, we're, we're kind of, we're getting the reputation of being a, a real restaurant uh, center you know, where we have fine, do, not just fine dining, but a, a whole array of different choices. Down on the riverfront, you've got, you know, uh, Big Fish and uh, and a, a bunch of others. Iron Hill, you know. So, 
we're in good shape as far as restaurants and getting better all the time. Okay, so what does the average day for a mayor look like? Ah, exhausting, no. <laughs> so I, um, I don't know what other mayors have done, but uh, I'm in the office at 8.30 for a start of our meetings. We have, a, we have our senior staff every morning, and we review the whole array of things that, that are on everybody's menu. And it, uh, it's everything from a problem with uh, the Department of Transportation to a complaint that somebody has about trash on a street. I mean, literally, it will go through a whole array of things. Then we have, um, then we have uh, our, our union's negotiations. We have to deal with those uh, issues. So, it's, um, so we'll go through this laundry list of, of hot items, most of the time problems, and try to solve them. Uh, we, have <clears throat> we have legislation that we're trying to get in front of city council, talk about who's going to be the sponsor. We'll talk about getting the finalized version of the legislation so we can review it to make sure it's ready to go over there. Uh, it's, um, it just seems, it seems like you get to the bottom of the list, so you finally solved all the problems, and the list just gets bigger the other way. So, you know, it just, it just continues to grow. And I think that's just part of it, and you get used to it. Um, I, don't think you get, I don't think you ever get used to the violence that, that happens when it does. I get noticed whenever it happens, 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning, or, or any other time of day. So I don't think, you know, you never get used to that. But as I said to you uh, uh, before we started, that, um, you know, our violence is down considerably, but any one incident is something that a mayor takes very personally. It was funny how Jim Kenney, the mayor of Philadelphia, made a remark about couldn't wait till he didn't have to worry about these things anymore. And everybody climbed all over him about saying that. And I remember my chief of staff, Tanny Washington, and myself saying, way to go, Jim. You should tell people how you feel. Well, he backed off it by the end of the day because they were saying, well, if you don't want to do it, you should leave. No, what he was really saying is this is, it's, it weighs on you when you feel personally responsible for these things that happen in your city. And so, I wanted to write him a letter and I didn't, and it was a, I'm, I regret that because I should have just said, don't, don't back off from these knuckleheads, just, you know, t tell them the way you feel. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of a little bit of a day in life. And then the other thing is I'm, what I'm doing with you is, you know, this, this uh, continuing to build relationships with our community is important because they, people have to understand that the mayor cares about them and their problems and understands them and their problems. It's troubling to me when people say to me, Mayor, what do you know about my life? And I always tell them, more than you know, but I take your point. Because they see a, they see a disconnect. They say, you know, is this, does this guy really understand my problems? And um, I can tell you, I can write a book on people's problems because, you know, I'm, it may not affect me personally, but I'm not that insensitive that I can't be around folks long enough to understand really what people go through. And so um, that's all part of what we do. That's all part of what we do. And there's a laundry list of things that I could go on to tell you, but it's never a dull moment, that's for sure. Okay. So what is your, like, most common problem? My most what now? Like, your most common problem Common that you problem. Get. Oh, good point. Oh, what's my common problem? You know, um, remember, I've got 13 members of council to deal with, and so they're elected. They've got to be given respect. Uh, but while we're doing this, you know, they may be off doing that, and we're not coordinating very well, and so you find yourself, you find yourself trying to keep the members of city council kind of on your, on your side so that they understand where you're going, so they're not running off in another direction. And I think that's just a big, that's just a big management problem because we've only got so many staffers, there's only so much time to be on the phone calling people. And many times I think what they're doing they really believe in, but they don't, they don't see our big picture. And when, in the end, in the end it's, the, it's the mayor's office that's running the city. And city council ought to be providing, you know, creating laws for us to abide by. The laws ought to be, that they ought to be consistent with our objectives. Sometimes they're not, they seem to be a bit detached from the big picture that we're trying to uh, to accomplish and, um, that, and you know, going back there and trying to deal with folks who are kind of off the reservation, if you will, uh, that, that takes time because they're, they got elected too, you know, so you have, you have to accord them respect and you have to work with them. Okay. 
So is gun violence. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you deal with that? So, <clears throat> so the best, way, the only way I think you can kind of um, assess how well you deal with gun violence as a city and an administration is to try to compare yourself with other cities. And uh, for a while, particularly when before I came here and in my very first year, it was awful. We weren't, we were no better than some of the worst cities in the country. Now remember, you know, we're a small city, so if we have, if it, we may have a small number of uh, homicides, but when you, when you measure us per 100,000 to other cities, you know, we weren't looking very good. We were right behind Baltimore, which is a really pretty tough city. And today, uh, after five years of a chief out of Chicago and New York, Bob Tracy, and his, the things that he did for us, and now with my new chief, Chief Campos, our, our homicides are down to the lowest they've been in 15 years, and violent crime the second lowest in 17 years. So we really feel good about where we are, and especially when I compare ourselves to other cities. Everybody says, compare yourself to Camden. They did a wonderful job. Well, Camden had 28 homicides in the same year we had 18. So, okay, you know, that's the best you can do is kind of, you know, have some benchmarks and see how you perform. I just feel really good about our city and our police department. Now, uh, probably the, to me, the, the error in this discussion is to continue to look at crime in the police department. What happens is crime is not a problem as such. Crime is a symptom of a problem. And it's trying to help, it's trying to rebuilding communities so that crime doesn't occur it's got, should be our objective. But it's hard to do. I mean, it's hard to do and create a, an ecosystem where all of a sudden everybody's healthy and people are working every day and the houses are in great shape and the kids wake up in a, in a real positive environment and go to school and do well. Well, that's not reality. And so for reality for us is what we, have to, we have to improve the neighborhood and we have to uplift our neighbors. And that is a job. So uh, it's not right for people to say cops get tough on crime and ignore that, but it's also, it's, it's also um, not right for people to say defund the police because you know, they're too tough on some of these guys who are carrying guns. I mean, there's, it's a tough balance, but you, gotta, you have to strike the right balance. And I, and I really think we're very close to the right balance. Okay. So going back to your personal life, do you have any like, favorite books that you read? Wow, how about you? My favorite books. Um, my favorite book was a book by The Life of Churchill by his, by his uh, authorized uh, biographer. Uh, can't think of his last name. Martin is his first name. But, so that was a wonderful book. I just finished uh, 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 John Meacham's book on Lincoln, which is a terrific book. I finished uh, a book called These Truths by Jill Lepore, a Harvard professor it was an excellent kind of historian. I think if you read if you read those two books, you'd you'd get such a good feel of American history. Most, it's almost as if in a in a in a country where I think most people have such uh, history information deficits that if you read these two books and only these two books, you'd walk away with a really pretty good feel for what America's real history is, the good and the bad, and they both account for the good and the bad. But they also they also um, highlight the heroism of some people like Lincoln, not a perfect, not a perfect human being, but a person I think with perfect aspirations. And so, yeah, that's what I read. And I read, I have, a, I read a lot. Okay. I read, I read a lot, <laughs> which is a joy. And I'm not, you know, it's funny. I have a terrible memory. I mean, I don't have a great memory. Let's put it that way. Um, so, you would think that if I, if you saw how much I read, you'd say this guy's got to be really, really smart. Well, I don't, I don't remember a lot of this stuff. I read a uh, Carl Sandburg wrote uh, a, wrote a book on Lincoln. It was 2,600 pages. I read the whole doggone thing, and I'm not sure I know, remember anything out of that that I didn't just read the one I, I just read. But you know, uh, but I, I love reading. Le reading is like it's like exercise. It's like it, you know, I love walking in the morning. This is like, you know, reading a book is like that. So it's and people people should learn how to read. It's an exercise that you have to learn to do, but there's a wealth of wisdom in the books out there that you know, are available to everybody if they would just take advantage of it. Okay, so 
do you have any like funny moments when you go out or somebody tries to pronounce your last name and they just get it completely That's funny. wrong? That's funny. That's very good. Yeah, my name gets creamed. I mean, you know, it's, um, yeah, it gets beat up all the time. I mean, the easy one's Przeski. I mean, that's probably the first, the first one they do. Um, the spelling of it is always gets butchered. Yeah, it's a Polish name. You know, it's uh, not as bad as some, but yeah, it, it's not an easy one to look at. So, I, so here you go. So I played football to Giants. I think we talked about that, right? And I came back, I came back from the food hall one day, and uh, there was a guy named Homer, Homer Jones. He was a great receiver, and he was standing in front of my door, and we had, we had taped our names on our doors, you know. And so I come back there, and he's looking at it, and he's, he's going, Zisky, <laughs> Zisky, he's trying to say it. I said, oh, it's Przisky. He goes, I just saw all those Z's and Y's and I's. I didn't know what to, I didn't know how to say it. That's kind of funny. I mean, the first time you see it, people don't get it right away. But yeah, yes, it gets beat up. <laughs> so um, do you ever go out like to have fun with your wife one-on-one? -on -one? Yes, yes. Not as much since she's watching the grandchildren, but yeah, we go out and we go to the restaurants and uh, we go to the restaurants in the city. We really enjoy it. We've got a couple of little, you know, a little restaurants that are not, uh, not the Bardea big night out restaurants, you know, just little corner places we go to. So, yeah. We've been married 39 years. That's a good thing. That's amazing. There you go. <laughs> so, um, going back to the Giants that you talked about, yeah. how was the behind the scenes on the Giants? Yeah, <clears throat> that's funny because uh, it was a different time then. Uh, the guys were... Um, uh, what, you know, they were, you know, when, you, when you're a kid and you look up, you're a 21-year-old kid, you're in this locker room with all these guys who've been around forever and you're pr pretty much in awe of everybody. And then you listen to them after a while, you go like, dude, guys, are, they're not as impressive as I thought. They were, like as individuals, you'd say, like a little bit clowny, you know, you say, it's like, because you, you have this idea that they're so great. So my favorite story, though, is there was a guy named Del Schaffner, who's an all-pro uh, uh, receiver, and one day we're in the, and uh, so I was a receiver, and so we're in the locker room together, and he just turned and he goes, hey, Slim, he called me Slim now. He was a stick. He was a 6'3", 170, and he'd say, hey, Slim. I said, yeah. He says, you know, the secret in this league to being a good receiver is to be able to run a good out pattern. Out pattern. He said, Slim, you can run a good out pattern. So I was like, oh, that's pretty good. I'll take that. I'll take that. That was a, that was a memory I have that was pretty rich. Okay. So... <clears throat> What would you say your best game as a player in the Giants was? Oh, I, well, you know, I got hurt. I got hurt before I had any big games. Yeah, you did get hurt. <clears throat> I had good games as, uh, at the University of Delaware. I had good games, but, you know, not with the Giants. So going to the University of Delaware, yeah. what were your favorite times in the University of Delaware? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously you're a kid, you know, there are parties, uh, fraternity house. Um, the university was small compared to what it is today. I think they have 20, there are over 20,000 students on campus. We had 4,500, you know, so it's a much smaller place. And everybody kind of knew everybody else. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was athletics, it was studying, it was going to the, uh, going, sneaking into the bars when you were young, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then fraternity parties. I mean, that's pretty much what, what, what it was. Uh, all good memories, no bad ones. I don't think I have a single bad memory at the University of Delaware. Okay. So, as a kid growing up, do you have any favorite subjects that you had? Subjects, as in? As in school. As in school? Yeah, so, um, I think I always liked, I liked history more than anything else, you know? And that's kind of followed the, the, the things I read today, you know, I really, the two things I read today are about kind of human behavior, neuroscience, light, and then history. So that's, that's what I do. And once, so, you know, <clears throat> when I grew up, um, you know, I would say I was a history major at the university. So I would tell you that if I had one, it would be history. And I, I wish I could tell you I was a great student and model yourself after me, but I was, I was a pretty modest student, I think, uninspired uh, to my, to my detriment. But you know. But I, I, worked, I turned out okay. Okay, so what were your best memories as a football player at UD? Oh, my, my best memories. Um, you know, we were conference champions. Uh, I 
caught ten passes in one game at the end of the game at the end of the year. That was that was fun. Uh, we beat. Uh, we beat Villanova one year. That was a big deal because we don't beat Villanova. Even today, we don't beat Villanova, which is crazy. So yeah, good, just not only good memories, great memories as a student athlete at the university. Okay, so so at UD, how was the college set up back when you went? College what? How was the college of UD set up when you went? Set up when I went. Is that yes. What you said? Well. How is it different? I mean, I you know it's funny. I I know it's I know it was different because the culture was different. You know, um, it was not a diverse school at the time at all. Which is you know, I I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, so Newark's a very you know it was um, the, the way people describe it today is there was diverse. We had we had all different ethnic groups in Newark. Well, I came down here, and the university was. Was very white. We didn't have, we didn't have very many black athletes even, which was, you know, it was kind of a, it was a, it was a different time, and the university was different even for its time, as far as I was concerned. So, um, I would say that was a big difference. The university, but the I don't know if the university was so much different as the world was really different. I mean, I I know this sounds like from another era, but. You got to remember, this is 19. I was in school in 1960s, so right before your parents were born is a good guess. But you know, and so the, just the world was different. Everything was different. You know, uh, everybody smoked. I mean, if, you went, if you went in the house, everybody was smoking. So if there was a party, there were cigarettes everywhere. The place was just was like you just wanted to get it sandblasted after everybody left. And today, you know, you go places and no one's smoking cigarettes inside a house. Is that a huge consequential difference? Yeah, no, it's one of those things. That everybody dressed kind of very, very different. You know, culturally, we were. You know, it was. The world had not. The world had not changed the way it has today in a lot of ways. And today's much better, in my judgment, much, much better than. No, it was terrible. I, I always tell people, there's nothing better for the good old days than a bad memory. If you go back and you see what things are like, um, when things are like back 40, 50, 60 years ago, you realize I, that's not very attractive. Now, I just, I just eulogized um, uh, Bishop Morton, who died recently, and I managed to find a certificate in, in the city records somehow, some way, and I talked to, there are 1,500 people at this thing, and I talked to everybody about her. And then I said, I want you to see something. Here's a certificate. It is a permit for her to preach in this church. And I read this whole, this, this enabling legislation. And I said, but it said that she is permitted, or she's authorized. I said, but they had to cross out he to put in she, or they had to put an S in there, because women, didn't, women weren't bishops back in those days. Women didn't preach in those days. You know, there were doors closed for everybody in those days. Uh, African Americans, women, gays. Doors were closed, and that was the world. So that is that a good world? No, it's not. I mean, so today, for all of our problems, today's a much better day, much better place. Okay, so that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you for coming, Mr. Mayor. Good seeing you. Okay, good seeing you too.